Cloud computing is like a foreign language. At first, it sounds like gibberish, EC2, S3, VPC, but then one day, it just clicks. The problem is most people quit before they get there. But what if I could prove to you right now that you probably know more about the cloud than you think? In this video, I'll walk you through the seven undeniable signs you're making progress learning cloud. And if you don't know these signs yet, don't worry. I'll explain each one in plain English without any confusing jargon. Now, I'm a self-taught AWS cloud engineer working for a global financial services company. So I know firsthand just how challenging it is to learn cloud. But if you understand this first thing, then I think you're already most of the way there. Here's the thing, when you're working with cloud, you're dealing with a lot of abstraction. You've got all these high level services and APIs, but under the hood, it's all built on top of three key building blocks, compute, storage, and networking. If you can wrap your head around these, I honestly think you're already most of the way there. And I don't mean you have to memorize a textbook and dive into a lot of detail. To start with, you should just know the fundamentals. Why do I think this is so important? It's because once you understand these, you can design good solutions. You can look at a problem and say, okay, I'll use this type of compute for the application tier, this storage service for the data layer, and configure the networking like this. It's like having a mental framework that you can apply to any cloud project. As a quick refresher, compute is all about processing power. It's kind of like the muscle that drives your applications. In the cloud, this is usually provided through virtual machines or containers. The beauty of cloud compute is that it's elastic. This means you can scale it up or down based on your needs and only pay for what you use. That's a huge advantage over traditional infrastructure where you're often stuck with a fixed capacity. Then there's storage. This is where you keep all your data, your files, your backups, your databases. Again, the cloud gives you a lot of flexibility here. Finally, you've got networking. This is the glue that holds everything together. It's how your servers communicate with each other and with the outside world. In the cloud, Networking is software defined, which means you can control it programmatically. You can create complex network structures, set up security rules and optimize for performance all through code. Now, don't get me wrong, there's still a lot to learn beyond these. Each cloud provider has their own specific services and quirks. But if you understand these, then it's a good sign you know what you're talking about. However, just knowing the theory isn't enough. When I first started learning cloud, I was taking an online course that covered all the core AWS services. I watched a bunch of videos and did these multiple choice quizzes to test my knowledge. And I was feeling pretty good. You know, I was acing all the quizzes and thought I had a solid grasp of how the cloud works. But then I landed my first job as a cloud engineer. And to be honest, I really struggled with some of the basic tasks. This highlighted to me something very important. Just learning the theory and memorizing facts isn't enough. You need to have hands-on practical experience actually working with the cloud services. It's one thing to know that a service like Amazon EC2 exists and what it's used for. It's a whole other thing to actually know how to provision instances, configure security groups, set up auto scaling, all of that stuff. I think this applies no matter what cloud role you're in. Architect, developer, data scientist, you can't really just rely on theory. In my opinion, if you've deployed something and have practical experience, then that is a good sign that you have an understanding of cloud. This doesn't mean you need to have 10 years in the industry or be some kind of guru, but you should know your way around the basic services and be able to configure the essentials. Imagine a CTO of your company calls you in for a meeting discussing a potential move to the cloud. It could happen. The CTO turns to you and asks, can you explain to us why moving to the cloud is the right decision? What benefits will it provide? This is your moment to shine. But your heart sinks. You realize you're not quite sure how to respond. You know the cloud is important, but when you're put on the spot, you struggle to articulate the key concepts. You start to ramble, throwing out buzzwords like scalability and high availability without really being able to define what they mean or why they matter. Then the CTO's face gets more and more confused as you speak and you can feel your credibility slipping away. It's a nightmare, really. Now, if you can articulate an answer, then that's great. This is a really positive sign that you understand key cloud concepts. It shows that you understand not just what the cloud is, but why it matters and how it can transform the way a business operates. And if you can't, don't worry, this can easily be fixed. Practice explaining these concepts, scalability, high availability, fault tolerance, serverless, and virtualization to your friends that have no knowledge about cloud. Here's a quick explanation with some simple analogies. Scalability. Imagine you have a lemonade stand that suddenly becomes very popular. Scalability is like being able to quickly add more lemonade stands to serve all of your customers without running out of lemonade. High availability. Think of a store that's always open Open, no matter what time it is, or even if there's a power outage. High availability ensures that your applications are always accessible, even if there are issues with the individual components. Fault tolerance. Imagine you're building a house with multiple support beams. If one beam fails, the house won't collapse because the other beams can hold it up. Now, fault tolerance works in a similar way. This allows your systems to continue operating even if an individual part fails. Serverless. Imagine you're organizing a party and hiring a catering service. You don't have to worry about cooking the food or cleaning up afterwards because the catering service takes care of all of that for you. 
you. Serverless computing is kind of similar to that. You can focus on your applications without worrying about managing the underlying infrastructure. Virtualization. Think of a large apartment building where each apartment has its own separate space and resources, even though they're all in the same building. Virtualization is similar. It allows multiple virtual machines or apartments to run on a single physical server or a building. The more you practice this, the more comfortable and confident you'll become. It can also be helpful to learn from others who are skilled at this. Watch how experienced cloud professionals present these ideas and take note of the language and the analogies they use. A good sign you know what you're talking about is if you understand the different cloud service models. A cloud service model is essentially how much control and responsibility you have over the underlying infrastructure. To explain, Imagine you're renting an Airbnb apartment. Everything is taken care of for you. Cleaning, utilities, furniture. That's like a SaaS or software as a service model in cloud computing. With SaaS, the provider manages everything. The servers, the operating system, the data, the application itself. All you do is log in and use it like with Gmail or Salesforce. It's super convenient, but you also have the least control and customization options. Now, if you rent an apartment through an estate agent, you might have your own furniture and decorations, but the building maintenance is still handled by the landlord. That's more like a platform as a service model. Here, the provider still manages the underlying servers and operating system, but you have control over the data and the applications you deploy. It's a good middle ground between convenience and customization. Finally, renting a whole house is like an infrastructure as a service model. You're responsible for everything inside the house, including the furniture, appliances, and cleaning. But the structure of the house itself is still owned and maintained by the landlord. Similarly here, you have full control over the operating systems, data, and applications, but the cloud provider still handles the physical servers and virtualization. Amazon EC2 is a prime example of this. So if you can break down the differences between the different models and explain when to use each one, then you have a good broad understanding of cloud. It shows you're thinking at a strategic level and considering the full context. And I think that's the kind of insight that is important for progressing your career. But equally important is the next point. A great sign that you understand cloud and something that is coming up more and more regularly in interviews is cloud deployment models. In simple terms, it's kind of like choosing what type of house to build based on your family's needs and budget. The deployment model you pick has a huge impact on things like cost, security, scalability, and maintenance. Now there's three main types of cloud deployment models that you should know about. Public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid cloud. Before we carry on, feel free to pause the video and try to explain what each one is and when a company would use it. This is a great way to test your own understanding. Okay, so public cloud is what most people are familiar with. It's where you use the cloud provider's compute resources, which are shared with other customers over the public internet. So for example, if you provision an EC2 instance on AWS, that's in the public cloud. Public cloud is great for variable workloads, rapid deployment, and minimizing costs. A lot of startups and smaller companies rely heavily on public cloud. Private cloud, on the other hand, is where cloud resources are used exclusively by one organization and not shared with others. It could be hosted internally in the company's own data center or maybe at a third party location. Private cloud gives you way more control and customization over your environment and can be necessary for organizations with super strict security or compliance requirements. A lot of government agencies, financial institutions, and healthcare companies, for example, use private clouds to keep their sensitive data locked down. Then there's hybrid cloud, which is exactly what it sounds like, a mix of both public and private clouds. Data and applications can be moved between them as needed. Hybrid cloud is great for optimizing costs, getting the best of both worlds for security and control, and avoiding vendor lock-in. Most large enterprises today have a hybrid cloud strategy. So if you can confidently break down the differences between these models and give some solid use cases for each one, that's a great sign that you understand cloud. Security is absolutely crucial in the cloud. It's not just some afterthought or nice to have. Security is often overlooked by many people. So if you understand the security fundamentals, it puts you in a great position to stand out. When you're running workloads in the cloud, you're essentially renting space in someone else's data center. And while cloud providers like AWS, Azure, and GCP have world-class security, there's still a shared responsibility. The provider secures the underlying infrastructure, for example, protecting the servers from natural disasters. But you, as the customer, are responsible for things like properly configuring identity and access management, securing your VMs, encrypting data, and so on. If you have gaps in your security knowledge, it can lead to vulnerabilities and potentially really bad issues. In my opinion, if you're able to, number one, have a discussion about these topics, Number two, break them down into simple English. And number three, maybe even walk through some examples of how you've implemented security concepts in your own work. Then that is a clear sign that you get cloud computing at a fundamental level. 
So a big part of understanding the cloud is actually unrelated to anything technical. In my opinion, it's very important to understand cost management. Take auto scaling, for example. This is where you configure your application to automatically adjust the number of servers based on traffic. More users logging on, spin up more servers. Traffic dies in the evening, scale back. Seems simple enough, right? But if you don't set up your auto scaling policies correctly, costs can quickly get out of control. Let's say you forget to set a maximum limit on the number of servers that can be launched. Suddenly, a surge in traffic causes hundreds of servers to spin up. And before you know it, you've blown through your entire monthly budget in a few hours. On the other hand, if you're too conservative, you run the risk of having performance issues and really frustrated customers. For example, imagine you're running an e-commerce site and your servers can't keep up with the floods of new shoppers during a big sale. You're losing out on a lot of potential revenue and really damaging your brand reputation. This is just one example of why it's important to consider costs as well as the technical side of things. But optimizing costs isn't a set it and forget it type of thing. You need to continuously monitor your cloud spend and be alerted when things are trending in the wrong direction. If you can't explain how to set up budget alerts or interpret the cost and usage reports, you're missing a big piece of the puzzle. Now, don't get me wrong, understanding the technical side of things is still very important, but being able to have a conversation around cloud costs and talk about different strategies for optimization is really what will make you stand out. Now, if you're considering a career in cloud, Knowing these concepts is essential. But what if I told you there's a dark side, a side that most aspiring cloud engineers don't consider? Well, you can find out why you shouldn't be a cloud engineer in this video.